Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Anderson with MetabolicCoaching.net. Thank you. Today our presentation is going to be Reversing My Diabetes presented by Doug Stone. And I want to just take a minute before he starts talking and tell you what he's talking about when he says reversing my diabetes. Um, Doug started taking the metabolic coaching course. He started the program nine months ago. Um, actually, about three years ago, he started to kind of work on his health and went on a lower carbohydrate diet, but wasn't really making the progress that he wanted to make. So he went on a very low, car very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet through the metabolic coaching program. And what's happened to Doug in terms of reversing his diabetes, his hemoglobin A1C went from 11.3 to 6.0. His fasting blood sugars used to be in the 490s, and now his fasting blood sugars are 90 to 130. But that's all happened. This is the reversing diabetes part. It's not that he's taking more medication, because for his diabetes medications, he's gone from taking three diabetes medications, three different ones at maximum dosage, to where now he's only taking half of his metformin. So better hemoglobin A1C, better blood sugars, only taking one half of one medication when he used to take three at maximum dose, dosage. Other things in Doug's health have also turned around at the same time. His triglycerides, Doug, Doug had fatty liver disease. He had very high triglycerides at 490. Now those have come down into the normal range of 112. His GGT, which is a measure of uh, liver function, he used to have very high liver function tests, 120, and now his GGT has gone down to 65. It's in the normal range. So his liver function is normalizing, triglycerides normalizing, his hemoglobin A1C and fasting blood sugar is normalizing. His total cholesterol has improved also from 196 to 169. He used to have low HDL cholesterol at 35, and now his HDL is 48. So you can see all of these things are all improving for Doug on a very low carbohydrate metabolic coaching diet. He has gone from for taking for his blood pressure, he used to take three blood pressure meds, now he only takes one. And a really interesting thing about diabetes is that a type 2 diabetic typically has super high fasting insulin levels and very high C peptide levels. And Doug, he used to have a fasting C peptide of 5.3, which is elevated, and now his fasting C peptide is 2.3. C peptide is a measure of how much insulin the type 2 diabetic is secreting. And his fasting insulin is now 10. That's in the normal range. Usually a diabetic has very high fasting insulin. So Doug's going to tell us his story, how he's reversing his diabetes with a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet through metabolic coaching. His weight has also improved. His weight is down, he's down 46 pounds. Doug is still making progress. He still has some work to do, and he's still working on his diabetes and his overall health. He feels great, and he's going to tell you how he did it so that you can learn how to do it too. Please enjoy Doug Stone presenting Reversing My Diabetes. And one last thing, I want to apologize. I was chewing gum that day, and I noticed myself sitting over there, because I didn't think I'd be talking, and I didn't think I was on camera, but I am, and I'm over there chewing gum, and so I want to apologize for that beforehand. Uh, everybody, uh, please enjoy Doug Stone Reversing My Diabetes. Okay, you guys, that, because, uh, so I've been doing a ketogenic diet since October 2nd, and during that time, um, I just it's just been a different world for me. It completely turned my world around. Um, well, I will say before I even got on that, though, a lot of my inflammation went down. In this recent blood work that I've had, it shows that my inflammation markers are real normal. Before, I hurt all over. My joints hurt. I had pain in my body almost all the time. I was miserable. I couldn't get up and down. It was just painful to just do normal stuff. And that improved with the Bally diet and the things that we did initially, but it's even a lot better now. And so, because the things that cause inflammation in your body are stuff like grains, too many fruits if you can't handle them. Some people can. So maybe this is not for everybody. If somebody can do a lot of fruits and grains in their diet and they thrive on that and they do well and they feel good, that's great. But if you're a diabetic or a carboholic, you're not going to be able to. So um, that's basically my story. I've been the last nine months on 
a ketogenic diet or low low carb high fat diet and uh, even that my weight loss was very slow at first and it was a little frustrating because my weight loss has not gone like this it's been like this and sometimes like that so it's not been like super uh, super fast super you know gradient like that where it's just coming down all the time it's been up and down even and I don't mean up and down radically but you know the the progression is like this it's not like that and so um, I forget how many how much weight I've lost I know that's the question everybody wants to know but let me look. It, it's funny to me that weight loss has kind of become a secondary issue because the first thing that happened to me when I really got into uh, what we call ketosis or when you really basically your body starts burning fat for fuel instead of sugar is that I just felt fantastic and I had a lot of energy and so that was worth everything right there all my inflammation went away I didn't hurt all the time um, what were some of the other benefits there was a lot of them but let me see what I wrote down here from July 2014 to October 2015, I was only able to lose about 22 pounds on the Bally diet, or the it was kind of a paleo diet, if you guys know what that is. I was um, I was eating a diet that would have been very healthy for many people, but that I now know contained too many carbs for me. So a lot of people could eat that diet and be really healthy. But if you're a diabetic or a carboholic, you're probably not one of them, and I know I'm not. And then from October 2nd until now, I've lost about 46 pounds. And honestly, I think I've lost 13 pounds of that in the last two weeks. So uh, it's been a little slow on the front end, but what I noticed with the low carb, high fat is it seems like it's going real slow, but if you wait six months and average up what happened over the months, you're losing like five pounds a month or something. So that that's really not so slow, but it feels slow when you're going through it. So um, at times the weight loss was very slow and it would go up and down even though I wasn't doing anything different. I had to learn some things about what worked best for my body. It seems the less carbs I eat, the more, and the more fat I eat, the better I do with weight loss. And with everything, I just feel better. And so, if you put that all together, I think since July of 2014, I've lost about 68 pounds. And most of that, though, has been in the last nine months, eight months or nine months. I, I was taking, uh, three different medications for diabetes the maximum amount of all of them and I was able to decrease and then get off of one and then decrease and get off of another one now out of three diabetic meds that I was on I'm on a half of half of the amount of one of those so that's a lot of meds to get off of and then same thing for my blood pressure I was on three meds related to blood pressure and I was I've been able to get off of two of those one of them I still seem to need and uh, so that's a lot of it what would you recommend Dr. Eddie, uh, Dr. Anderson I recommend everybody do just what Doug did <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put these numbers up here the A1 uh, the A1C is 11.3 to 6.0. Explain to them what A1C is. So hemoglobin A1C, um, red blood cells in the body, red blood cells in the body, they last for three months. And what happens is sugar sticks to the red blood cells. And so uh, when they measure how much, how much of the blood cells have sugar stuck to them, that, that gives you an average of the blood sugar over three months because that's how long the blood cells are around. And so, you know, just like his fasting sugar here was 491, and now it's 100 to 130. So this A1C, there's a calculation, but A1C of 11 is somewhere around 
you know, 400s. It's in the 400s. And as A1C is 6, it's going to be down somewhere around 100. It's toward normal, okay? Now, what happens to most people is on the American Diabetes Association website, it says that type 2 diabetes is a progressive and chronic condition. <laughs> progressive means it gets worse. And chronic means you're going to have it like the rest of your life. There's nothing you can do about it. For most people, if you keep eating the same diet, the regular the regular American diet is 60. Doug is eating 5% carbohydrate. 5% carbs, more or less 20% protein, and 75% fat. If you're eating a regular American diet, which is 65% carbohydrates, diabetes is a progressive and chronic condition. It's going to progress to complications, and the complications like kidney failure from diabetes, once your kidneys have failed, you can't get your kidneys back. If you had a heart attack because of your diabetes, you can't take back the heart attack. So the complications of diabetes really are irreversible. <coughs> But the diabetes itself, you can reverse the diabetes by doing a low carbohydrate diet. Because what happens to most people over time is they start off on one diabetes medication, and then they get on two, and then they get on three. That's because they keep their diet the same. But you cut the carbohydrates out of the diet, then instead of, instead of it being a progressive and chronic condition, it's a reversible condition. Um, I had a discussion with the endocrinologist, and the endocrinologist, he said, I, we just had class today, and in the class we talked about insulin resistance. Type 2 diabetics are insulin resistant. And the endocrinologist said, really the insulin resistance, once a diabetic has it, it's never really, it's not reversible. If you measure their, their C-peptide, which is a marker of how much insulin they make, it's still going to be high. But Doug, now he's normalized his blood sugars and normalized his hemoglobin A1C, his C-peptide is normal. You know, he still takes a half of the medication for diabetes. But even, so I called Dr. Bernstein, the guy who wrote Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. Two books I recommend a diabetic should read is uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution and Dr. Atkins' Diabetes Revolution. But I called Bernstein. And he said, I said, have you ever seen it normalized? And he said, sure. He said, just because the endocrinologist has never seen it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But it doesn't happen because your endocrinologist, it's not your endocrinologist's fault. But the, the, AD, the American Diabetes Association guidelines tell you to eat, um, I think it's uh, 45 grams of carbohydrates per meal plus two 20-gram snacks. So it's like, you end up to get somewhere around 200 carbohydrates a day. And what we're talking about here, 200 carbohydrates a day is fine. If you want to stay diabetic the rest of your life. But if you want to not be diabetic instead of 200, you're doing 20. I had two different nutritionists that I was sent to just get really mad at me because I told them there was no way on earth I could eat 200 plus grams of carbohydrates a day. And feel like anything in the first place and not have outrageous blood sugars but they just got irate with me for saying that and that I thought I knew something about my own body <laughs> and so some other things what what is it that what kills diabetics what gives them the bad complications things like uh, kidney failure okay and so for Doug his Blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine, those are his two kidney function tests. They used to be elevated, but now they're normal, right? You save your kidneys. Um, Can I, yeah, go ahead. Say about that? That's super important to me because on my dad's death certificate, it says that his cause of death was renal failure. And that, they didn't even say anything about diabetes, but that is directly related to diabetes which he had for over 30 years mm -hmm. and didn't, you know, back then they didn't have the kind of medication that we have. I feel very grateful because for the many years I've been trying to learn about this stuff, I've had so much better medications than what my dad had. But anyway, that, that kidney function test means so much to me because of that one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad was on dialysis for 
number of years and it was gruesome. Another thing, um, so when you, the other thing that kills diabetics, the number one killer of diabetics is going to be heart disease, right? Um, and so to look at Doug's numbers, his, I don't have the breakdown here. Well, I do have some breakdown. So high triglycerides are a bad risk factor for heart attack. And his went, triglycerides went from 490 to 112. We just talked about this in the class. This is what happens when you go low carb, right? So more than 150 is high. So it went from 490 to 112. His HDL cholesterol, which is his good cholesterol, went from 35. For a man, you want your HDL higher than 40. So his is too low. His HDL went from 35 to 48. So now it's up in the normal range. His total cholesterol, I don't have, this is not your LDL, but his total cholesterol, people are worried, if I go on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, aren't I gonna blow my cholesterol out of the water? And his total cholesterol went from 196 to 169, right? Total cholesterol went down, that's good. Well, I mean, whether or not it's good is debatable. But, I mean, your doctor's going to be happy with that. But the HDL going up, that's good. The triglycerides going down, that's good. Those are all the things you want. Now, cholesterol is just one risk factor. All those are just different risk factors for heart disease. And another one is the CRP. It's a marker of inflammation. They can measure lots of markers of inflammation in the blood. And Doug's CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, it's a risk factor for heart disease, was was 4.5, 4.5, and went to 1.6 into the normal range. So people ask about heart disease and doing a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And I'll say, you know, they have shown, oh, the American Diabetes Association, they published this data. Uh, Dr. Bernstein says they let it slip. <laughs> they, they let it slip that for every one point reduction in your hemoglobin A1C, it decreases your risk of a heart attack by 45%. So getting your A1C down from whatever it is, 9, 10, 11, for every one point you get it down, that decreases the risk by 45%, you're going to have a heart attack. And these other risk factors too, you know, the CRP, HDL, <coughs> triglycerides. And I love that because on my labs and talking to my nurse practitioner who gave me the feedback on my labs, my labs say that I have a lower than average cardiovascular risk. Everybody knows fat people have heart trouble, right? Not me. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions for Doug? Go ahead. I'll give you a, a kind of report on my and whenever I first started coming to you, my A1C was nine. Uh -huh. My last one, 5.0. All right. Um, so, yeah. And it's about the same time frame because I think we started probably about the same time. So I think if I started in either September or October. Yeah. A1C, nine to 5.0. And I'm on zero meds now. I was on metformin, but I'm even off of that now. <coughs> So the nice thing about so how many years you had diabetes? Mm, yeah, over 20, I think 1994. So. 20 years. So the longer you've had diabetes, the less likely it is you're going to be able to get off 100% of your medications. But after tw even after 20 years of diabetes, he's gone from three to taking a half of one. For someone who's just diagnosed with diabetes recently, the great news is you can get off your medic you can you can normalize your blood sugar and get off your medication pretty quickly. That's because some for people who are newly diagnosed with diabetes, they don't have as much insulin resistance. We talked about that cycle where you eat carbohydrates that causes the blood sugar and insulin levels to go high, which the longer it stays like that, the more insulin resistant you get. The the shorter it's like that, the easier it is to <coughs> reverse. Yeah. Now, th you will still probably be, you'll still probably be insulin resistant your whole life. Yeah. 
which means if you go back to eating an average American diet that's 65% refined carbohydrates and sugars, guess what? You're probably going to put on weight and end up diabetic again. But if you don't, then you can stay... If you don't, then you can stay... This is the thing. People with a normal hemoglobin A1C, normal blood sugar, who aren't taking any pills, what do you call them? They're called normal. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, they could be considered pre... People, the physician will always call them a diet-controlled diabetic. And that's because they're always at risk to develop diabetes. But you're, you're not at risk of all the complications because your A1C is normalized. Your blood sugar is normalized. I have a question for you, Doug. What, um, what's a typical meal for you? Like, what do you eat for breakfast? I need ideas. Okay. Uh, bacon and eggs almost every morning. Just because it's... It, it works so good for the type of diet, mm -hmm. and I don't mind it. Sometimes I get sick of eggs, but lately I'm just willing to do it because it's easy. And um, I usually, during the day, I have a green drink that I drink that's a lot of uh, greens and a powder, and I drink that blended with uh, spinach and sometimes some MCT oil for fat. Sometimes I throw a half avocado in there. And then uh, at night, usually uh, some kind of protein, uh, maybe a vegetable, maybe, uh, I don't know, some kind of fat added to it usually. I mean, that's really basic. And I purposely just keep my stuff boring because I don't want to think about it that much. So I just make it easy as much as I can. You know. I think that's the hardest part is just figuring out, especially in the beginning now, I'm so used to it. But you get yeah. out of that, uh, what am I trying to say, combinations. Like you go, we're used to, okay, hamburger, french fries. Well, now I just get, ham I may have a hamburger, but I don't put the bun. Yeah. And I don't have the french fries with it. You know, and I do a lot of spaghetti squash. That's awesome. I love spaghetti squash. You can do a lot with it. And yeah. different, I don't know. You just have to like. But don't think of it as a normal meal like we're used to. It may be an avocado right. and some chicken and, I don't know, just a lot of nuts and just different things, not what you would think of as a typical meal. And Traditional. I, think I like what she said at the yeah. beginning. There's a big learning curve yeah, and yeah. there's a lot to learn. It's and it, it can be really <laughs> frustrating. Me, I get kind of obsessive about the research, and I kind of like it, so I just kind of go for it. But I can understand how people can get kind of overwhelmed, and there, there's a ton of good Facebook pages that where you can just get on there and just watch the threads and see what people are saying, and that's as helpful as anything. And there's a ton of good websites, and this is really popular now because it's working for so many people. So. I mean, it's easy to do research if you got a computer and you know how to Google. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, ma'am. The carbs that you do eat, like what are those? Mostly green vegetables and just stuff that I don't even think about having carbs in it. To me, carbs is a piece of cake, <laughs> you know. But <coughs> but like, it's interesting because on this diet, you can go over your carb limit with vegetables because they, they have more in them than you would think about. And certain ones have quite a bit, like onions are sweet, they have quite a bit of carbs, so you can, but uh, one of the things that Dr. Westman recommends, who's one of the guys that talks about this diet a lot, is just, uh, I think he recommends two cups of green leafy vegetables and a cup of regular cooked vegetables every day, and that's basically your carbohydrate consumption. So he doesn't recommend a lot of other kinds of carbs. And the carbs kind of add up because you only get 20 grams. So, you know, you don't think about an ounce of cheese having one gram of carb, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're adding it all up. And I know that sounds super restrictive, but what's not restrictive about it is that you're not hungry. You feel satisfied, you're not craving food. So that makes a big difference rather than I can only have 20 carbs and I'm ravenous and I think about food all day, every day. 
because it's not like that. That high fat, the high good fat, it turns off your hunger and, and keeps your carbs low. So what about those of us who eat even when we're not hungry? If you'll get your fat up and your carbs down, your hunger will turn off and you'll quit doing that. That's what I think. The eat, um, lots of the eating when you're not hungry is because your blood sugar is coming down. Yeah. You eat, if you eat any sort of carbohydrates, the sugar goes up and then it goes up within an hour and then it starts coming down. And as the blood sugar is coming down about two hours after you eat, this going down is when you eat again. Up. Uh, and so you get it back up and two hours later you eat again so people get into the cycle of eating every two hours all day long every day and i don't know um if you would describe this as as hungry or not if for people who eat because of addiction like sugar addiction um i would say kind of the best thing to do is to listen to the uh as part of this course we give you the the audio tracks you listen to those audio tracks that work like hypnosis. Those help. Also, I had a lady who she had, she really kind of struggled the first month. And she struggled the first month until she made, she made fat bombs. You guys ever heard of fat bombs? So she would make fat bombs. Well, do you remember, she, she would use peanut butter, yeah. coconut oil, and did, did she just use cocoa and stevia, or did she use like 86% dark she's chocolate? Done both. So she's done both. So you take those three, those three things, which are all very high in fat, they're low in carbohydrate, you, she would mix it together and put it in the fridge. And so her, she really struggled a lot with candy and sweets. And whenever she felt the urge for sweets, she would open up the freezer, break off a piece because she had it uh, spread out on a cookie sheet and have that for a snack. And so that really kind of helped her to get past it. It has to be no sugar peanut butter, right? That's right. Your peanut butter that you buy should have no sugar. And just turn your peanut butter and look at the back. And the two ingredients should be peanuts and salt. Because if it has sugar in it, it'll have twice as many carbohydrates in it as, as peanut butter that just has peanuts and salt. But I really believe that hunger and being hungry all the time is driven physically. So if, you know, eating fat turns the hunger off and getting your carbs down helps with that too then it takes care of a lot of that because when you're eating carbs what dr anderson described is constant and it does feel like hunger when your blood sugar is seesawing all the time and, and when i was eating carbohydrate diet if i felt that ravenous hunger i could almost be sure my blood sugar was high usually i'd go test it and it'd be it would be high but i could tell by how often i got hungry so how to get 75% fat in a diet a day? Uh, it, actually, let me just, do you mind? No, I'd love for you to. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's not as hard as you think, because if you take an egg, like for example, an egg, the egg by weight, it's something like half protein and it's half fat. But uh, protein, fat has twice as many calories in it as does protein. So it works out to somewhere like an egg is like 66% of calories from fat and 33% of calories from protein. So this gets you, real, just the egg itself gets you real close. And then when you add something to that, like butter or whatever, then that helps. You know, uh, one way that I add fat to my diet, and I, I eat this kind of like a meal. There's something you could do for like, well, you don't even drink coffee. But I do it kind of like a meal. Is I take a, a cup of coffee, I put a tablespoon or two of coconut oil, I blend it with the high-speed blender, which emulsifies it and spread it all out. And so that's a meal that's 100, the calories are 100% fat. And there's no protein, there's no carbohydrates in that meal. And so I do that. So a lot of people do that to get their fat content up so that they reach that. Mm -hmm. Salad dressing, lots of olive oil on your salads, that helps. You can also salad dressing, we use vinaigrette at my house and the vinaigrette, zero carbohydrate. So as much as you put on there, the calories in the salad dressing are only from fat. Some, some salad dressing has a lot of sugar. So you have to look on the back and you have to check it and see how many carb carbohydrates it has. You know the way, I don't know if your mom used to cook, 
of green beans this way, a can of green beans, a stick of butter. That's how my mom cooked them. Mm -hmm. Don't use margarine. Anything that's hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, they did a, <coughs> they did a big study looking at the people who ate the most saturated fat, the most poly, which is supposed to be bad for you, the most polyunsaturated fat, which is supposed to be protective as far as heart attack goes, and the most hydrogenated vegetable oils. The people who ate the most saturated fat and the most polyunsaturated fat had exactly the same uh, heart disease risk. But people who ate the most hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, they had high, higher heart disease risk. Okay? Yeah. Sorry. Come up this way. No, no, no. I'm good right here. I'm good right here. I was just coming to support my friend, so I'm kind of all the same. Here. <laughs> Watch out behind you for that deal. Okay. Is there something in the materials online or someplace that says these are the good vegetables you can eat and these you don't eat? In the handout, yes. It's right there. Yes, ma'am. We're talking about butter. Can you do ghee? Yes, ghee. So what ghee is this? Ghee is clarified butter. It's, it's, bit, it's butter. It's Indian. What they do is they warm, they warm up the butter. They remove off the protein. So it's just like pure fat. And so ghee is fine. Any other ways you add fat? Because people always ask this. I eat a lot of coconut oil, and sometimes I use it for an appetite suppressant. I just <coughs> eat a spoonful of coconut oil. I also cook in it, and I, I, there's so many health benefits to coconut oil, and if you use up to three tablespoons a day, it can even help blood sugar and stuff. So sometimes I try to get three tablespoons a day in, which is 300 calories, which is a lot of calories from coconut oil, but it's got a ton of health benefits. So it really helps. Are you helps talking me. about like the solid you take? Mm -hmm. I know we went to Sam's the other day and there was, what did I tell you? There was refined and there was virgin. Mm -hmm. And you told us. You want the unrefined? The virgin unrefined. Yeah, so the I mean the 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 virgin unrefined coconut oil, uh, it hasn't been through like a chemical process, and so that's good. It's not going to have like chemical type residue on it. the 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 virgin coconut oil tastes like coconuts, and it, there's a book that's all about coconut oil. And so anyway, uh, in that book, one of the things he says is that, but if you're going to fry something. If you're going to cook something at very high heat, you need to use a saturated fat. And it's better to use a refined coconut oil than it is to use like a vegetable oil. So your, your, your virgin coconut oil would be your, your top choice. Then the refined would be your second choice if you're going to fry something or cook it at high, high heat. And then after that, you would use, um, I mean, you could use butter or lard butter, lard, bacon fat, something like that. Um, the point being, oil? the refined coconut oil doesn't have as much of a taste to it. So some people, they just don't like the taste. And if you're going to cook something, you don't want it to taste coconutty, you know, it, it doesn't bother me. But if it bothers you and you don't want it to be coconut oil, coconutty, it would be better to use the refined coconut oil than to use a vegetable oil or, or uh, corn oil, something like that. But it removes part of your health benefits if you use the refined versus the unrefined in my research. <laughs> I'm a lumper, Doug. I'm not a splitter. Okay, Other, what, what about what? cooking with the almond flour and stuff like that? Is I mean, that's what I make a lot. I make the waffles and I make all that sort of stuff. Is that going to keep you from losing weight? Is that going to be a... The only thing I would say is count the carbohydrates in your count the carbohydrates in your recipe, because it's really pretty easy with almond flour because a cup of almond flour is going to have nine net carbohydrates, yeah. and then you just decide how many waffles did you make. <coughs> yeah. um, if you add if you add milk to it, you have to count the milk too, which is going to have something like eleven or twelve. I add cream. So cream is better. <coughs> cream is like I think it's a half of a carbohydrate yeah. for a one or two yeah. tablespoons. Yeah. 
What is it? It's pretty low. Yeah. It, it's pretty low. A milk so, and time. Yeah. yeah, it's a half for, for two tablespoons. A half for two tablespoons for cream? So. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Almond milk or maybe one tablespoon. And I don't, I don't know what it is for almond milk. But she was talking it's about for heavy cream. One carb for a cup. Almond milk, one carb for a cup. So add those together and just divide it by how many you eat. Because um, for some people, it's just like Doug said. You know, if if you're if you're eating if you're eating ten or fifteen net carbs for breakfast and another ten or fifteen for lunch and another ten or fifteen for dinner, then you're getting up around forty five. What happens is some people they'll say they'll say I'm stuck, I'm stuck. I'm not making any progress. And I'll say, well, let's talk about what you eat, and then we'll look for all the hidden sources of carbs. And there'll be there'll be lots of hidden things that aren't getting counted in there. During the during our session today, we were talking about like the Atkins nutritional bars. They have sugar alcohols, and on the Atkins nutritional bars, they subtract 100% of the sugar alcohols from the carb from the the carbohydrate content. But on, on those bars and a lot of the health food, food bars, it'll say total carbs, something like 25, fiber, 5. So 25 minus 5 is 20. And then they'll say sugar alcohols. And that'll be another 16. So they'll say net carbs, 4. And they'll print it with a real big star around it. 4 grams net carbs. And, I mean... Anyway, it's not is true. that right? I it's, mean, the sugar alcohols you can't count them down to zero. They don't count for zero. They count for half. So instead of sixteen, it's eight, and twenty minus eight is twelve. So you're eat, you're eating even in Dr. Atkins' books. So I mean, his comp well, he's dead. You know, <laughs> Atkins is dead. But his company sells these things, and they <coughs> subtract out hundred percent of the sugar alcohols. But in his book, he says you have to count half. And 20 minus 8 is 12. So it'll be something like somebody's on the road a lot, they're a driver, they eat two or three of these a day, and they say, I'm not losing any weight. <coughs> yes, ma'am. I know you know that I'm struggling because I'm a vegetarian. Right. Is there anybody else who is vegetarian? Because it is really hard to try to, to do this, and I'm trying, but. The one biggest thing I'll tell you is kind of like it's kind of like Doug said, it's it's the fat part. You have to kind of emphasize. You have to find ways in your diet to specifically emphasize the fat as your source of calories. Because for for all the meatitarians in the room, you know, burgers are easy, eggs are easy. But you're getting your fat and protein. But then for me, burgers are easy, eggs are easy, and, and for a vegetarian, it's hard. It's hard. You have to you have to emphasize. Do you eat eggs at all? I do. No, I you grass, but yeah, you said pre range grass fed yes. eggs are expensive. You want to know my advice for you? Oh, do you do you have a yard? Very no yard. Little, very little yard. Yeah, I see. Well, uh, we have chickens in our backyard. <laughs> we have chickens in our backyard, and so that way I know that I know exactly what the chickens eat, and I know the chickens are well taken care of. And that your egg. we don't sell the <laughs> eggs, but we can, but we can, but we can eat them every day. And I can feel very good about it, you know. Uh, and there are some people in town who sell right. eggs. Because the thing is, if you buy the free-range eggs, it's going to cost you, they cost like $8 or something. They're very expensive. Uh, but there are people in, in town who... Um, well, that's why I say I only eat very little, because uh -huh. whenever they're on sale, that's when I eat them. <laughs> right. Otherwise, I don't eat them. But um, I know the farmer's market is coming up, I'm going to eat them and I'm going to eat Yes. And then tomorrow they're having one West End. Uh-huh. Um, 
Yeah. And, and the, the beans, the amount of beans that you need to get your protein is too high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Too high in carbs. Too high in carbs. Other question for Doug? Yes, sir. Is there, to add to the question earlier that was mentioned as far as what sources you use to help you with your menu, is there a particular website or cookbook you go to to figure out what mm -hmm. you're going to plan for the meals for the day? Um, there's some, uh, one of the best places to start is probably, is it Dr. Weston that has the food list? Uh, Dr. Weston has uh, a basic food list of what to eat. And where's the, where's the yes, name? okay, so um, if you guys want to, you can email me. So Dr. Eric Westman, Dr. Eric Westman at, at Duke, he treats diabetics and people with blood pressure and stuff. He treats them with a low carbohydrate diet. <coughs> he has this little booklet, and on his little, he has a little booklet that you can order, um, which is basically it's the same thing that's in the Atkins books. It says what you can eat and what you cannot eat. It's pretty straightforward, and it's similar to what's in the handout that you got from here. Um, go ahead. But you can get that same list on several Facebook pages. Uh, I think Reversing Diabetes Facebook page might be one of them, and there's several. And so at the top of the Facebook page, on the bar up there, there's a thing that says Files. And if you just look at their files, or some of them will, you know, it will give those kinds of things where you have a basic list of what to eat. And do you normally eat just a small, moderate portion three times a day, or do you eat six times a day? Uh, right now, I'm eating two or three times a day because I'm working on a kind of a supplement to that that has to do with when you eat as well as what you eat. So, uh, but I think less is better within a, within reason. So, two or three times a day for me. So, one of the things one of the things that you can do if you're trying to lose weight. And if you're trying to, to if you're trying to lose weight, and if you're trying to reverse your diabetes, either of those two things, then it's all about decreasing your insulin levels. And we talked about that in the class. So one thing you can do to decrease your insulin levels is you eat low carbohydrate. Another thing you can do that decreases insulin levels is to fast. And fasting, there's two ways to fast. You can do what's called bulletproof intermittent fasting, which is if you're saying you're eating two times a day, you probably eat like lunch and dinner. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you eat well, lunch. And sometimes I eat breakfast and an early dinner, and then I don't eat from like 6 p.m. till the next morning. Okay. So one way you can fast is you eat lunch and dinner, and you don't eat the next day again until lunch. So that way you have a 60. Most people fast for eight or ten hours. But instead of an 8 or 10 or 12 hour fast, you have a 16 hour fast which lowers your insulin levels. Another thing you can do is you can eat Monday and not eat Tuesday. You eat Wednesday and not eat Thursday. You eat Friday and not eat Saturday. That's called alternate day fasting. So that's another thing you can do to get your insulin levels down. Improve your insulin resistance. And I can be sure that I would never be able to do. I'm just kind of getting used to this fasting idea, but I can tell you for sure I could never have done any of that when I was eating carbs. Right. But now that I'm that I'm not eating so many carbs and I'm not hungry, then that's doable, and that's part of what is helping on blood sugars. But I'm I'm just on the beginning stages of that, so I still am really just learning about that. You know, I had started fasting one day a week, and I thought I would never, ever be able to do it. But since I've been on a low carb, the mornings are a little tough, but by mid-afternoon, I'm fine. And it has kept my blood sugars within normal limits. And even on a day that I kind of have a little more carbs than I should, or maybe, you know, cheat a little bit, my blood sugar's still okay the next morning. And I think that fasting one day a week has really helped and really changed that. 
what I've found is that like at the beginning, if you tell somebody at the beginning, hey, look, an option is to just not eat some days, right. then they think you're crazy. Right. <laughs> it's much e it's much easier to do do low carb and get people low carb, and then if they get stuck, and it's not one of the common reasons for getting stuck, then you can consider doing. I, there was a, a a professor who came and took the course. He says he fasts every Monday. He just doesn't eat Monday because it works okay with his schedule. Yeah. And he wanted to lose weight a little bit faster. Uh, some people have taken the course fast two days a week or three days a week. And so that's something that you can do after you've done low carb. Mm -hmm. Do you need to leave? I gotta go. I gotta go to work. Yeah. Okay. Just unlock that door. Okay. Unlock Thank that you. door right there. I commend you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Um. It is 4.30, so I, we'll take, a, a, if you guys want a couple other questions, we'll do them. If you guys want to run, we'll run. I have one question back on the coconut. What about the meat? It's fine. Just, just, just it's a fine. little crunchy? Still good to tell? Yeah, the, the meat is fine. Just uh, don't buy it sh Don't buy it sweetened. You know? yeah, he's talking about buying a, a, raw a raw coconut and breaking it up. Go for it. it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can do it, do it, huh? Go for it because um, things that things that you want to decrease the blood sugar spikes and the insulin spikes in your body, and things that decrease that are fat and fiber. And I'm not talking about whole wheat bread fiber, but there's a ton of fat, there's a ton of fiber, and just a, a regular coconut. So and it's good. And it's good. What was in the fat bombs of one of those you said? You can Google fat bombs on the on the internet, and there's a, a bunch of recipes. There's thousands of recipes, but the one that Carol made is she made them with uh, coconut equal parts, coconut oil, peanut butter, 86% dark chocolate. Just melt those together, put it on a thing, put it in the freezer, and you can eat them. I, I get a lot of recipes off of Pinterest too. Mm -hmm. You just put low carb recipes. Yeah. Yes, so there are lots of recipes and the things the things that you should look you look out because a lot of times you have to find them and then you have to sub out some because some low carb recipes it's going to be low carb but it, it's got wheat in it. And I tell people avoid wheat 100% get rid of it or it'll be they'll say like low carb paleo or and low carb paleo it'll have honey in it. So in, or you'll search for a low carb recipe and you'll end up with a paleo recipe. And paleo will have honey or maple syrup. And I say get rid of the honey and maple syrup, make it stevia. So that's what my wife, my, yeah. my wife is, she finds them all on Pinterest. And, mm -hmm. Well, I did, uh, I did a deal last night where we had almond flour and flaxseed flour in it. And no sugar and all that. Just cheese and eggs. And, and you didn't call? heavy cream. <laughs> <laughs> I should have. I made, it made a big deal of it. Okay. But I can eat the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, um, the flaxseed does not going to have any net carbs in it. But, but uh, watch it and see how much it is. Yeah. Um, the cheese has carbs. Some cheese has some carbs in it, yeah. How do you know? I mean, I know it'll say it on the back. Is there, like, you, like cheddar doesn't have it or... Uh, most has one gram per ounce. Per ounce. Yeah, so if you have an ounce of cheese, you have a gram of carbs. A lot of them. You have to check. Processed cheeses are not something that we should really eat. So, right, Jacob yeah. has seven or zero carbs. Yeah. Who does what? Sargenta has seven or zero carbs. Okay, so I'll just, I'll close just a little bit. Um, in closing, we talked about this in the course, I talk about it almost every course I give, that your carbohydrates increase the blood sugar so your body makes insulin and the cells respond to insulin, which decreases your blood sugar and then you kind of get hungry and you go through this cycle. When you chronically eat too many carbs or too much carbs, more than your body can, which I just defined as more than your body can handle, the sugar stays high, the insulin stays high. The cells begin to resist the insulin. They don't respond normally, so they don't get the blood sugar down. 
so the blood sugar stays high which meant you make more insulin the insulin resistance gets worse the blood sugar stays high this spins off in people as things like diabetes PCOS overweight and what brings it all together is insulin resistance insulin resistance that's what happens here so the great thing that you don't control anything under my arm the only thing you can control is the amount of carbohydrates so you cut the amount of carbohydrates that you put in the diet it decreases the blood sugar decreases the insulin your blood sugar goes down things start operating normally you're, it's not going up and down all the time so you're not hungry all the time and you you actually improve your level of insulin resistance okay and that's how you improve your diabetes what happens is a lot of the diabetes medicines we give are aimed at this blood sugar but high blood sugar is not the high blood sugar is not the cause of diabetes the cause is too many carbs in the diet more than your body can handle and a lot of some medications we give are aimed at this to make your pancreas make more insulin but making more insulin type 2 diabetics already have too much insulin in their body they're resistant to it so that doesn't address the cause but too many carbs that addresses the cause um the thing is if you're walking around with a blood sugar of 400 you need something to get it down while you work on this so your, your medications hopefully will be a bridge to get you back down to just normal blood sugars uh, normal blood sugars normal risk of heart disease so when you're talking about 20 carbs is that 20 carbs or 20 net carbs 20 net carbs so you subtract out the fiber a cup of pecans is something like a cup of pecan halves is like 20 total carbohydrates it's about 15 of fiber so a cup of ha pecan halves is only five net carbs and that's what matters i'd like to say thank you to everybody uh thank you to doug for coming mm -hmm. i want to say thank you to god dr anderson dr edwards and my wife Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's right back there. Mm -hmm.